everybody. Uh, welcome to week three of object oriented programming. And I wanted to start off with something pretty cool. There's going to be links to this underneath the video. And this is a project. Both uh, the live version of the project and a link to the GitHub are going to be here. And this is a project called Shiget. Uh, and what this does is this uses the GitHub Events API to watch what's happening in GitHub and look for, in real time, new secrets, uh, things like authentication stuff you can use to figure out how to get into servers, how to get into databases, um, usernames, passwords, there's one right there. Um, and it's looking, it's super cool. It allows you to see really quickly how much uh, there is in terms of security issues generated every day. So. Uh, what happens is it uses the GitHub Events API. So this is a read-only API application programming interface um, to watch events as they happen in GitHub events in terms of uh, people checking code into repositories, right, that kind of thing. So you can read more detail about that online, but uh, it uses the GitHub Events API to look for certain kinds of secrets. So the idea is that secrets are things like potential private keys and PFX files. So these are private key files that really shouldn't be uploaded as part of the GitHub repository check-ins. Like, <clears throat> we'll go through an example that has connection strings in it, but they're generic ones where they connect to the local developer's device. They don't have usernames or passwords in them. Um, but it looks like this is live finding all kinds of stuff, all kinds of different check-ins. This is just looking at the Google events, or excuse, excuse me, the GitHub events API and watching it live real time. So it could be seeing you checking something in, me checking something in, anybody checking something in. Um, so you could easily get this code, run it, look for vulnerabilities, um, and just run random exploits really so there's since this is out there there's people that are doing that right there's people that have machines running just running this looking for stuff trying to get into stuff trying to use it there's another one trying to use uh, credentials to get into some server store some files there do whatever there's another one do whatever um, it is they can do with it so super cool again not anything directly related to class but whenever I find cool stuff like that especially when the source code itself is in github um, you can run this from Docker. So, that's something we haven't looked at. Unfortunately, we don't have time to look at it in class. Um, but you can install Go and then use um, Go and Git from GitHub, like right here. This is probably, oops, probably a simple, easy way to do it. Because Go is easy to install. Then you just um, run one command to get the repository from GitHub. Um, and then you can run it just like here. Super cool. So, that's something fun for you to check out. Next thing I want to mention was the test. Under the homework section, um, you, all this stuff is grayed out. I see this, but you don't see this, so don't worry about that. I just didn't delete it. Um, this is the stuff, <laughs> my word, this is the stuff that will actually show up. So, the grade exemption. If you run into any difficulties in class, um, and then the first test is posted. So that was my first big topic for tonight was a test. So the test is like 10 questions, uh, multiple choice, true, false. Take as many times as you need, that kind of thing. Let me know if you have any issues with it, but it covers the topic so far. Introduction to object-oriented programming, inheritance, encapsulation, you know, that kind of stuff. Nothing too big. Okay, so we'll have that test and then we'll cover data structures, how to use, um, like we did before, the HTTP dash server package from NPM. Um, look at the data structure examples to see stacks and queues and go over all that kind of stuff uh, in general. We'll do that. Um, then we're going to look at a case study. I had a student that had a question. Uh, mentioned something here. Let me. Uh, this is it here. I was wondering about how one would set up a text file that acts like a database that your code can read and write to, and affirming that the information is correct, which you know is like a good 
homework question, that kind of thing. Um, and I think it's a good example to go over. And what I have is like a case study. You know, one of the things we talked about in class was what are some real world examples of how you use this stuff? And this is a real world example of it that I'll go through. So these topics for tonight will be on the next test, the final exam, basically. Um, so why don't we get started first with our data structures example code. So this is the same stuff that we went over in course documents and then in this OOP presentation data structures. Let me grab it from Google Slides so I can open it and edit it if need be. And data structures. <clears throat> this was setting up Visual Studio Code Node.js um, so that we could run a web server and then debug JavaScript files. And those JavaScript files were definitions of stacks, queues, link lists, of course arrays, the beginning object, everything for data structures. The general idea there is you could follow along with the book. All right, we did this some in class, so I'm going to go through doing that right now. Um, first, we have to have VS Code, right? I already have that installed. Um, if you don't have VS Code, right, you would go to code.visualstudio.com and install it. And then you get the Chrome debugger extension after that, right? You can just go to extensions in VS Code um, and search for Chrome, and it'll be the first thing that pops up too. So then you have to install Node.js. That is the third, oops, that's the third step. So remember this has a current <clears throat> branch and an LTS long-term support branch. So I usually just install LTS because there's, chances are there's a lot of third-party applications or third-party NPM packages that should support that, the LTS version. So that's a safe one to install. So we install that stuff so we've got our engine running. Then we get the files, right? So this is a link to the GitHub repository. and click on clone or download and then open in desktop. I've already done that here. Okay, so then I go to my repository. And I just show it in the Explorer. I can see it's already all set up there. All right, so, but that's the same thing we went through in class. Setting up all your stuff. Um, <clears throat> setting up Visual Studio Code with the extension. Um, and after we do all that, we should be able to open this folder with code. And let's see what we got. So the structure I think looks good. We've got .vs code as a subfolder, right, with our launch.json. Okay. And examples is a subfolder, so that's gonna match up there. That's good. So I'm gonna go into my terminal. <clears throat> right. And After I installed Node.js and got the files, then I have to do my npm install of http-server to be able to run them, right? So, in this guy. So, <clears throat> I have our terminal, npm install http-server-g, I think that's right. NPM, our node package manager, then we're going to install this package HTTP-Server, or that's our um, hypertext transfer protocol web server, basically. It's a simple implementation of a web server um, in JavaScript that we can use command lines. So this is really good for any kinds of debugging type stuff. You can run emulators, you know, and like I, in mobile application programming, we look at this kind of stuff too, and we use emulators for Android, iOS, and so on. Um, but this is great because it spits out a log of what it's doing right there. You can easily install a web server and run any kind of code. So you add that. Um, you can debug in the web browser with Chrome's uh, debug extension in Visual Studio Code so we can hit breakpoints in there. We can also hit breakpoints in Chrome itself. So works out kind of nice. Um, so 
Let's see. There we go. NPM checks, sees what's going on, adds HTTP dash server and any dependencies, right? That's the whole idea of using NPM. NPM again, just for quick review. <clears throat> it's the node package manager. There's all kinds of packages you could look for to find if you want to be able to interact with a database, that kind of thing. All kinds of stuff you can work with. So, once we get that set up, our HTTP dash server is um, installed and we just have to run it and then we should be able to debug our applications so right, we do a node start oops start uh, let's see what is our command I forgot I'll just HPS server. Silly. <clears throat> so it's connected on my internal external um, IP addresses. So my local loopback 127. Um, I happen to have virtual machine switches on here. So I've got a bunch of different IPs it's connected on. But they all happen to have port 8080 open. So that looks good. That's going to match our examples, right? So, once we're there, we should be able to look at our examples folder in like chapter one, for example, there's our hello world. This just looks at some variables, um, something to start up with. So I should be able to run and start debugging. And I, if I set a breakpoint in here, then it hits my breakpoint, right? So this, setting this part up is like step one, basically. I continue my debugger, and it loads that page. If I hit F12 in here, remember, I go to my console, that's where I see the output. So if I hit chapter two variables, or I'm sorry, section two variables, or chapter three, um, create initializing, initializing arrays, I see all the output in the console. So, getting this part set up is really the first step, okay? Um, so, VS Code extension, Node.js, get the files, and then set up the web server and start it up. So, once we've done that, um, <clears throat> these chapters, right, match along with the book and all this code that's in the book is in here also so what I did be done before and I suggest you do um, and we'll do more of this in the next class too is um, go through the textbook let's bring that guy up here So, oops, wrong textbook. Boy, excuse me. I'm losing it. Alright, so. Chapter 1 goes through um, the basics of JavaScript things like variables, right, um, different types of variables. So here's the section on variables in chapter one. And if we go back here, we've got variables here. Let's see if we can get this organized nicely. <clears throat> JavaScript basics are hello world, variables,
scope of variables. Where's our variable scope operators? Oh, whoops, my bad. Right here. So, I just wanted to make sure these matched up perfectly and kind of go through that process so you can see what I'm talking about. So, the idea here is, I won't go through the whole textbook um, every chapter. We did a good amount of that before, um, but I wanted to show you. It's relatively easy to set the same thing up again, right? And then go through each chapter. I'll hit some highlights right now, and then we'll come back. Um, to this next week and see some more too but um, I want to cover some of this and then cover my case study too so our first chapter covers the basics of JavaScript we should know most of that down pat pretty much by now uh, I would assume in chapter 1 chapter 2 um, chapter 2 is uh, ECMA script and the differences between ECMA script and JavaScript. Uh, we talked about that also and how that's still something that's in a state of flux right now. So <clears throat> there's multiple versions of ECMA script and uh, you can set your web browser to um, support experimental JavaScript. You can use Babel to transpile it basically to take um, JavaScript and turn it into ECMA script that kind of thing also alright um, and the reason this is delved into is because the source code in addition to these chapters under examples if you go under source and then JS and here is the actual structures behind the scenes these structures behind the scenes um, that I suggest you look at in detail, right? This is how a stack is created. This is how a queue is created. These are actually objects. If you notice it, it look at like stack or queue. Um, export default class queue. This is uh, a class like in a traditional sense of a class that's done in Java, that kind of thing. Those features to support that kind of stuff is part of ECMA script, right? So, again, we talked about that before. I just wanted to cover that in a little bit of detail so you understand how this stuff is supposed to work. So, <clears throat> chapter one, chapter two, ECMA script, JavaScript, arrays, that kind of stuff. Relatively easy. We should know most of that, most of that uh, by now. And let's see, after arrays, we have stacks. So, in our examples, chapter 3, and chapter 4, so 3 is arrays, and 4 is stacks. So, <clears throat> the general idea here is that, and you probably remember this from before, but I have to cover everything again. So, uh, Arrays are the base data structure object. Everything deals with arrays. We'll look at uh, this uh, example afterwards that deals with arrays pulling in sets of data. Almost everything deals with that, right? You've got a set of data. We want to talk about um, analyzing like with the pandemic or analyzing any kind of traffic. These are large data sets, right? The general idea is that array is a set of objects that you can add more to we've got in this set um, an average temp array we can add more items to that array <laughs> remove it it's just a series of buckets it's like the simplest version of a database so there's some kind of a set you could have a series of different sets so you could have a set for customers a set for products an array for customers an array for products right um, an array for orders and create representations of database tables in some form or fashion in there. Um, so it's wide open. It's just a set of data. You can add, as we can see in this example, I can put just, if I want, I could skip 
these items and just set the fourth or excuse me the fifth item in the array um, and skip the first ones if I wanted to there's no kind of structure in this data set okay so the array is the base above that we build data structures and that's where stacks come in so a stack <clears throat> has a simple set of operations okay um, we can push something onto the stack we can peek and look at what's on the stack or we can pop something off the stack that's all it's a structure that stays this way for speed purposes right we talked about this before uh, the idea is that there's only one way to access that so we don't have to worry about memory being jostled around anywhere changing there's just this one spot where we can add stuff remove stuff everything stays in line that's it okay so that stack is a very simple structure but used for a lot of fast memory movements it's easy to put stuff on and take stuff off okay the queue Um, the stack follows a LIFO structure, last in, first out, right? Whatever we put on top of the stack is the first thing we're going to pop off. We put things in a queue. Uh, this is different. We're going to add elements to the queue um, and then take them off, okay? So um, instead of having a structure that we can only access at one point, we have this structure that um, has a beginning and an end, like the ticket queue so I can decide to add to the end of the queue or I'm basically like popping off the top of the queue and receiving my ticket so it's kind of like a stack but in this scenario we might have elements that are aging right so um, this is how you would handle like tickets like any kind of event where it's first come first serve so the same idea applies then in terms of LIFO being for a stack, FIFO is for a queue, right? So first in, first out for the queue, last in, first out for the stack. So you see the differences there. If I have something that has to age and be done in a certain way, so if I was the first person there, I received my ticket first. If I have some software that's keeping track of that, like if I'm going to do a drop, right, and I have to go or I have to be the first person to sign up for something or the first person to buy something, right, there's only 2,000 of them. We have to have some kind of a queue where if I'm the first person to select to purchase it and then you purchase afterwards, mine goes through first, right? So that's the queue. Uh, if that doesn't matter, we're just worried about storing everything and pulling things back off. Um, we're going to use the stack. Um, and certain kinds of operations might want a stack. Instead of first in, first out for things that are aging, we might have last in, first out for uh, manipulating equations, that kind of stuff. If we're breaking down large equations, um, we could use uh, an RPC uh, Polish notation. So postfix notation is a way of storing data. Let's see if this has a good example. Yeah, there's one at the beginning, I guess we could go with, but let me see. Alright, so in this example, there's an equation. Let's boost this up and talk about this for a second. So there's an equation 3 plus 4 times 5 in reverse. Uh, reverse Polish notation um, the idea is that we're when we add the 3 and the 4 together and times that by 5 we're doing those operations in a certain order we can put them on a stack we can pull them off from the stack reading the expression from left to right following operations to perform if a value appears next in the expression push this on the stack if an operator appears next pop two items from the stack and get the result. So the general idea here is 3 plus 4 times 5. So in my head I say 3 plus 4 is 7 times 5. Well if I want to be able to operate those kind of operations um, via a computer in my head 
I'm kind of storing the times 5, manipulating the 3 plus 4 into 7, and then doing the 7 times 5 to get 35. So that's cool for me to do in my head, but how do I transcribe that to a computer? So well, one way to do that is use a stack and use these operations, these RPN rules. If a value appears next, get this one off the, the stack, push it off. If an operator appears next, pop two items and then push the result back on the stack. So there's a times, so we got to get stuff out. So I've got to take a five. Oh, there's a plus, so we got to take that stuff out. Okay, so the idea there is you're building um, this operation uh, sequentially, piece by piece, kind of like you do it in your head, but um, representing that in a stack so you know how to pull them off, do each piece, pull off some more, and do each piece. Okay, so it's one way that stacks are used. Again, kind of hard to visualize in some ways, but if you think about it that way, is exactly how do you do it? Well, you take the 3 plus 4 and then the times 5 and you kind of store the times 5. You look at the 3 plus 4, you do that, that part's done, then you times that by 5. Well, same idea here. You put that all in buckets, all right, and it's using memory space just like you are, right? Take the times out, pull this, all right, now we need to pull these. So same kind of idea. Um, <clears throat> so that's a common use for stacks, stuff like that, where we can do fast operations uh, quickly. Um, in queues, we want to keep the order for a different reason. We might have people or objects uh, or data in queue for qu quite some time. So you think about, I think about this a lot with um, the way web, uh, HTML, uh, CSS, and JavaScript work. Um, the HTML and CSS are processed on the page and shown and then JavaScript events fill in the page later on. So you, a lot of times you see a blank page or a templated page, some layout, and then the data fills in afterwards or maybe something fails you don't see all the data. Um, that is a queue kind of thing. So the idea is we don't know how long it's going to take for the whole page to load. So maybe there's a page trying to think of a good example, something like Facebook is probably a good example. As Facebook loads stuff in, um, you probably saw that as the page loaded. Uh, there's a bit of this delay, so there's like the basic page loads and then pictures and stuff fill in afterwards. So that's a queue, right? Um, when that's happening in the web browser, let's see if we can kind of show you. Uh, let's clear this, and then if we go to Facebook, as that loads, there's our queue filling in. You can see there's more network traffic. It finally finishes. So, lots of network traffic that it generates. Probably more than necessary, but um, that's a queue. The idea is, I'm going to set a bunch of stuff out there. Um, I want... Uh, the basic HTML and CSS to load maybe in this set first and then after that we're gonna have images and stuff load later on so I want the page to get started I want to see the page I want people to see that layout and see that the site is coming things are coming may not have all loaded yet but it's coming and uh, previous to that there was like one whole um, process that happened so HTML CSS, JavaScript, all that stuff had to run, and then the page was split out, spit out when it was finished. Took a long time. We had a delay there. Um, now everything is on multiple different threads, as you can see. The page was rendering. I could respond to it. I could have clicked on stuff in Facebook, but the network stuff was still going crazy. Was downloading more things. Uh, probably sending, you know, all my data somewhere. Um, but actually, it was downloading stuff to my machine. I shouldn't say that. So. That stuff was, whatever it was, was not essential to the basic functionality of the page. So maybe there's certain things that are in queues and stacks. It depends on what's going on. But we're going to have a queue that has um, certain pieces that are maybe not essential. Maybe we use stacks for these other pieces. Maybe we have multiple queues. Um, but those are data objects or data structures used all the time. So I suggest you go through the JavaScript. Um, go through those examples like we did previously in the book, but do it again, you know, um, and learn about stacks and queues some. 
Um, I'll just have some basic questions about them on the final exam. And like I said, I'll go through them some more uh, next week too. Um, we still have one more uh, session. So, um, the uh, next thing that I wanted to cover, next topic I wanted to cover was uh, an example I have of uh, using data structures and using object-oriented programming. So, this is after this section. So that was setting up data structures. We got that stuff done. Now, this is uh, an example in GitHub, and I'm going to go through and explain what this code does, um, what it's for, how it works. So this is, again, will be linked underneath the video. And this is, um, with no readme yet, but that's okay. This is a set of projects in Visual Studio. Here's my Visual Studio uh, Solution Explorer. Okay, and the idea here is this is a set of projects to handle uh, keeping track of inventory for one of my biggest clients, American Refining Group. So um, this doesn't have any person, you know, like any specific data for them. It's generic. I made a very generic uh, version of it so that I could show it as an example. Um, and the idea here is keeping track of inventory. All right, this is a tough thing to do. I thought this was a perfect example based on the question. So the idea of the question was, um, how can you set up a text file that acts like a database so that your code can read and write to and affirm that the information is correct? So uh, this is an application that does just that. So they have tablets, handheld devices that they carry around to um, gauge all of the tanks with to use to collect that data. So when I say gauge the tanks, let's talk about what that means. I had some, uh, let's see. So um, ARG is like uh, refinery and also um, a place where oil is received as a refinery. So they get a lot of crude oil and uh, refine that crude oil uh, and other products basically right so as part of that they have a bunch of storage tanks so this is a good example of a storage tank if you've seen I'm sure you've seen pictures of uh, American Refining Group online you've driven past there in town right this kind of thing so they have all kinds of tanks all kinds of storage tanks for the crude as it comes in um, some of these tanks uh, have fixed roofs, floating roofs, meaning the roof actually moves down to cover the liquid inside of it, that kind of thing. Um, and all of those, you have to keep track of how much product is in those tanks. And those are big tanks, and there's tons of them. So uh, and it's not always true that you can easily have some electronic device to get the readings from all the tanks so so because sometimes the products are like waxes or things that might be hard to gauge right so in some cases you might have things like this where you have um, either a gauge that sends like a tape or some device down inside to figure out how much product is in there um, sometimes people do that they actually run tape or you know there's all kinds of different ways that um, people can get these gauges in and <clears throat> in a lot of cases um, it's not all automated you have to collect that data somehow so this is an application that allows the user to select a unit of the refinery and then go through and gauge tanks now I've obviously like removed a lot of the data so you don't know like what products are and that kind of stuff um, and the idea here though is that you can see how an application works and we talk about like the structure of it and data structures used within it and that kind of thing so uh, there's a series of tanks that you look through and check the, how much product is in them based on the feet and inches of the product and then there's a bunch of different data that you use to say alright well this tank is a certain size and we know that three 
feet six inches worth of product equals out to this many gallons of the product um, as a generic overview that's kind of the idea there's a standard where we get um, gauges based on height and then we can convert them based on what we know about the product the temperature out of what the product is that kind of thing so the user goes through and gauges um, tanks they say oh this one has this much product and it's this temperature and then this one has this much product and it's this temperature they gauge however many tanks they have to gauge they get to the end of it and there's all their data they save those gauges and when it saves those gauges what's happening there is it's saving them actually to the local hard drive so when I hit save there it made this file and obviously you can download the code and see this yourself too right so it makes this file that's uh, called a .tdt file so what I did was I made a tab delimited text file CSV uh, comma separated value files work pretty good too but commas are in data a lot and tabs aren't in data as much so um, like in this case there's not going to be any reason for tabs to be in the data so I can I parse for it to clean it out anyways but it's just I find it more convenient um, the files also look nice if you have to deal with this data a lot like this application is a series of different projects so it's kind of like an engine right there's fuel coming in this data there's processes that are taking this and moving it in other databases and then there's reports and other stuff coming out the other side so when you have a scenario like that you want to have something that's easy to work with because you might have to go in here and tweak this a lot so we're collecting this data from all kinds of different sources some of it might be um, automatic you might have automatic meters that send data in this format or in some other format and you convert it and this is your like final data set that you load in um, but this is a file that's on disk like the question was asked it's a, just a text file and then this data is read back in and synced into a database the idea there is you might be collecting gauges somewhere where there's no internet connection uh, on a device that loses internet connection you know refineries uh, a lot of businesses that are in those kind of industries have large physical plants may not have wireless internet everywhere and they may not be perfect also um, you want to have in some cases ways to store data locally so there's many different ways to store data locally in applications um, Android and iOS um, their SDKs come with local SQL type databases like SQL Lite that kind of thing um, so I have to do this this way but this was in this case for Windows devices uh, Windows tablets um, and uh, so I had to support those anyways and I wanted something that was pretty much bulletproof so as long as there is this disk space on the device and permissions have been broken for some reason this is going to work for the next million years um, it's simple it will always work use a simple SQL it could work with any SQL uh, Microsoft SQL server MySQL Postgres Oracle whatever um, this thing would work with all of it so the idea is it writes that file to disk and then um, later on you can sync it to the database hit send to the database it sends them into the actual database um, in that case this is this tank aging data table I'll go through setting all this up but just so you know order by date time taken descending <clears throat> so those are the gauges it's 11 32 p.m. Um, 23 28 so that's uh, those are the gauges I just had on disk they shuffle them into the database so this is what the question is about now let's go through setting this whole shebang up and how it worked so um, there's a github example out here that's going to be linked to right you click on this you can download this bad boy float it down open it in desktop right and to get this to work though you need to have SQL server of some sort um, I mean you could try to change connection strings and have it connect to a different database type but 
uh, this is easy enough to set up and also they have a really cool edition the developer edition you may have seen this before already but I just want to talk about this for a minute and all this stuff about SQL Server so all the different editions excuse me so there's developer edition the idea for this is it's licensed for test usage non-production okay SQL Express is more like um, this is hobbyist very small production type stuff like one user type production type stuff licensed different okay um, and then you have standard and data center and enterprise editions on top of that standard is like a normal one you would buy for a server you might use um, where it's like a one instance server you know there's 20 to 100 people maybe connecting to it um, enterprise or data center data center you might have a lot more people connecting to it um, enterprise you might do um, certain features that with synchronization amongst database servers and other features that aren't part of standard basically so <clears throat> in our case I just say we want to download SQL uh, server developer edition it's a very simple one you download it you install it you don't really see much difference it installs some stuff here like the SQL Server Configuration Manager where you can see uh, your TCP IP name pipes, the different protocol setups, you don't really have to do anything with that but it installs that kind of stuff, the Configuration Manager oops, excuse me, and the engine itself but there isn't really much really front end pieces for that. The other piece and when this installer finishes it prompts you to do it uh, anyways, but the other piece you need, of course, is SQL Server Management Studio. So this is a great piece of software um, I've used for years, beating the crap out of it. Very rarely does it fail. You've seen it, I'm sure, and worked with it. But um, the idea is you install Development Edition SQL Server and then install the Management Studio. And once you have that in... Our example is a script you can run. So, uh, excuse me, where is here we go? I already ran the script here and started everything up, but if you had not done that, so I already have the database that it um, wants, but I'm going to go to File New. Um, Oops, excuse me. File new query with current connection. Just so I have a window open. And in GitHub, when I clone this repository, after I open it up, right in the root of the repository is this script.sql file. So this will regenerate the database. I can basically click and drag it over to here. It opens it up. And the only thing you're going to have to check is this path. This part I can't know for sure. Like on my machine, I moved a lot of stuff to my D drive. So when it wants to make the database, um, I switched it to the D drive. You might have to change that to the C drive. This path might be different, okay, for where your databases are. You might have to do a little bit of screwing around to figure that out. What I do is you go to System uh, Databases and then Master. And if I go to right click and go to Properties here, Okay, under files, there's always going to be these master model MSDB and temp DB databases. These are used for the master is like a list of all the databases in the server. The model is like this is the basic one that I use to make a copy of when I make a new database. So, like in Word, there's a template called like uh, doc one dot doc x or something like that. That's like your generic Word template. So, like, let's say you wanted Comic Sans, every time you open up Word, um, you could change that template to use Comic Sans 72 point font as your default, and it would always do that. And here you could go into the model and add store procedures, change stuff to the model, and then whenever it makes a new database, it'll always include that. Um, MSDB and TEMDB is Microsoft's other stuff, and a TEMDB for um, just putting junk in that could be cleared out. So, anyways, the point is those databases are going to be stored in this path is the same spot that you want to go to in yours so see how mine is d program files microsoft sql server 
MSSQL 15.MSSQL server, blah, blah, blah. Yours, you want to change this to be the same, so it makes them in there. And then this will go through, when you execute it, make the whole database, set everything up for you. So once that is done, you should be able to literally open this up and run it, like I'm running it right now. So when I exit it, I'll show you, let me get you into some details about how this works. So that's setting it up, and then this is like what exactly is going on here. So let's open up our first, this is uh, where the application starts. This is formatted to work specifically for an exact screen size. Um, it runs through each item doing some checks for each item, etc., that kind of thing. Um, that's not really necessary for this, the data structures part. Um, when we get to the end, we switch to this other form, this review and save form. So you go through the application, you're adding gauges, you're adding gauges. All that stuff is stored in an object. So there's a tank gauging report object. See this tank gauging report class file? public class tank gauging report. When the uh, application is started, when you go from the main menu to form one, uh, let's go up to the start of form one. Auto save table, and I think this is our, let me look at what else we got here. Tanks, set tank info, current report, yeah, okay. So there's a tank gauging report class that defines like each gauge, like all right, I gauge this tank. Um, these are all in uh, string arrays. Here's a list of tanks, list of products, list of feet inches. So as you go through and add gauges, when you add one gauge, the zeroth, the first array item will have its value, and then the second gauge is the first uh, for each array will have its value, and then the third, um, fourth, and so on. So they're all stored in this class as separate arrays inside that object, and then that object is kind of moved around, okay? So like if we go to this form review and save, when this form review and save is created, it gets sent all that data. So form one has it, you say next, next, you skip to the end. Um, sooner or later you get to the end of it. When you get to the end of this uh, set of gauges, this review and ready to save method, this um, makes a new form to review and save it, but it sends it uh, a copy of all that data, uh, actually it sends a reference to where all that data is um, in this util class. So as you gather the gauges up, they're stored in here in this current report, which is a tank gauging report object with a set of arrays inside of it, okay? Um, <clears throat> And then that's shown, and inside here, it pulls in that object and then fills in the view based on it. So this goes through looking in an array, pulling values out of the array, that kind of thing. Okay. So in this form, also, when you're done, when you click on saving gauges, this takes the um, data grid that's on the screen and writes it to disk and it's called 2csv but I changed it to uh, t, uh, dt for tab delimited and I send tabs instead. Um, but the idea here is it makes that file out to disk in a specific format. Okay, So then that one piece is done. You go through the form, you take all your gauges, save all the gauges, it's an object that's stored in memory but once you hit save gauges that's saved. and also, there's an autosave process in there, too, that if you forget, um, it, it's saving on its own, too, but you have both of those things going on. It's saving those to disk, right? Then, later on, um, oh, you, you're going to want to sync those back to 
the actual live database, right? So um, that's the other form. And this, when this runs, what's going on here is it's looking in this tablet tank aging folder. This is like its internal data structure on the user's device, basically. They've got um, today's tank ages, some other info about like what products should be in certain temperatures, that kind of thing. And then notice there's auto save files. Whenever I start, there's an auto save file. When I finish, it's saved as a .tdt. And then when I process it, it's got dash processed add to the end of it so that I don't process the same file twice. So this is kind of meant to be fairly fault redundant, you know, or fault tolerant and redundant. Uh, so as long as you get them saved here, even if you try to sync and something's wrong, you can sync them tomorrow. They still sit on the device. They stay on there forever. Something goes wrong, you could go back to that processed file, um, rename it, rerun it, edit it, you know, all kinds of stuff. Um, or you could clear them out and delete them. So the idea is here is, you know, we're going to get this data. We're going to get this data. We're not going to lose anything. We're going to get it from step to step. Um, and we're going to do that process instead of, you know, oh, well, we're sure we're going to be able to get into a database. No, we don't. We want to make sure we get the data and then we get into the database later potentially. Um, so at this point when we're when we hit send a database this is the next part of the question so the first part of the question was how do we save data to a file so that was a 2 CSV which spits it out basically loops through each part of it um, let's see where's my 2 CSV let's talk about that for a second So that's that's for SQL data reader. That's another one. Another way to do it. This has a couple different examples in there. Um that's a data table. Which one of these gets data grid? Yeah, alright. So the idea is this form review and save has uh a data grid in here. Alright, so I use this is like an easy way to do it. Like I have the data as an object with the rays in it and then I have to show it to the user and the user might edit that data at some point on that screen. Okay, Maybe they notice that they did something wrong and they put in six feet instead of seven feet. They can change it on this screen and then save the gauges. And so at that point that screen's data is this data grid view. If there's none in there just return but you know, and hopefully there should be. So if we go through there, get a list of the columns, make a list of those, write that to the file. That's the first row of the file. Okay. Then go through each row, figure out some of the data, and then in this string builder, keep appending all of that. And then a new line at the end of it. So every time you do that set, it's going to spit another line out on that file. Right. So if we look at one of these processed ones, we said do all the columns, and then new line and then we went through each row and hit a new line so that's what this code is doing using streamwriter a lot of classic .NET stuff uh, system.io.streamwriter system.io.stringbuilder that kind of thing nothing extremely fancy but the idea is you get a string builder you spit out a bunch of data and you use some kind of format right like slash t for each tab so field slash t field slash t field slash t um, field and then new line environment dot new line so that's our column we're writing it out like a typewriter right so that's our first row and then we go through each data grid row itself <clears throat> get the field append it and then a slash t field slash t field slash t field slash t and then new line start back over so we're writing it out in a format that we know it's simple format any program could really read it afterwards so that's like the first step writing the file out then the next part was verifying that data getting that data back that's when you're sending it to the database so that's when we go to the old gauges uh, and send to database then we look in that folder okay and then we want to process that file um,
I gotta look. There's certain files, these Tanginfo and ED users. There's certain TDT files in there that I'm using for other stuff, like I got a list of tanks and what group should look at the tank. I've got a list of Active Directory users, that kind of stuff. Um, so, uh, those files I don't want to process. I just want to leave those files as they are, and because they're not they're not tank aging data, obviously. So I just have a special if in here to say skip those files. Um, if it's not one of those files, but it ends with TDT, it should be a data file for me to process. So then, this is where I get into the juicy part of it. So then, I have a stream reader, okay, that's pulling that file in. So remember that file is a series of rows, okay? And so it keeps reading that in row by row using rd.readline. It splits it on the T, right, on our tab. And so when I split it, since I made that file, okay, I know that when I split that file, uh, splits sub zero is going to be the tank number. Splits sub one is gonna be the product. Splits sub two is a description, etc. So I fill those out. Here's two description, feet is three, product. I pull all those out. So that's really the secret key to it, right? Is that you've got some process you control that spits out files using commas or some separator, and some other process you control that reads in the files by splitting on that same separator, right? That general process would have worked, you know, uh, when files were first invented and will work forever you know um, and also the advantage there is it doesn't require anything special there's always going to be some way to save a file to disk and there's not any hokey proprietary format to go wrong either so you could write something like this um, somebody could add in a react native app that works with it and then somebody else could have a COBOL app that works with it um, <clears throat> you could do whatever you want with this and it would still be able to function right so that's to me when I'm writing an application I'm trying to think in these generic scapes where maybe five years from now there's some other application that has to work with this and this application still has to keep working okay or maybe five years from now I'm not here I'm not working on it is someone to be able to understand the code is it written simple enough to be reusable understandable or are they just gonna to want to throw it away does it have enough components that can be changed etc so let me talk about that for a second too if you look through this project there's a project called data entry this was the initial application that they used to set up um, or I'm sorry to, to get tank gauges and this ran on a Windows desktop <clears throat> they used a mouse and keyboard then they switched to tablets so I just added this tablet project to the solution. So there's other pieces that move this to um, an i-series, which is an IBM i-device afterwards, um, a big IBM database server. <clears throat> an application server is more than that. It can do everything. Um, some of this data is moved into there uh, afterwards. That's another part of the project. Um, there's also a, um, another piece that sits there that could process files if somebody just dumps files into a location. Uh, that fit this format so there's f uh, a lot of flexibility there um, with how this works like I said you could add a react native Android iOS application to collect these gauges uh, and still use these parts for moving them into other systems like the i-series or um, if you have other Oracle databases another kind of database you want to move stuff into um, that's the typical kind of thing you use a web service to send the data somewhere else into an app another application that stores and uses data um, for like adjusting how equipment works, right? That kind of thing. There's a lot of automation possibilities there. So try to be flexible, you know, do piece by piece. And, and so I think in answering that question, the idea there is that in this case, it takes two different applications to do that because you're writing the file with one application and reading it with another one. Um, mostly because of timing. I want to be able to write this file whenever I want, make sure it's saved, and then later on get it from somewhere else. So hopefully that's useful to you. Hopefully that answers the question. Um, and like I said, I didn't go through everything in all detail. I want to go through um, data structures some more next week. And um, 
so I left some for you to work on this week. So check out the Node.js HTTP dash server stuff, get that set up, and then also check out this example. Uh, take a look at it. It should give you some um, some idea of what it's like to build an application in the wild. This was done, you know, parts of it were done a couple years ago, parts of it were done probably 10 years ago. So it's a good example to check out and let me know if you have any questions about that too. Alright, thanks. See you next week.